In love, we love each other. And engaged. So when's the wedding? Later. We'll get married later. Tekla Schunemann and Lars Novak are a couple with Down syndrome. Their group home holds regular discussions about love and sex because at this facility in northern Germany, they believe people with disabilities also deserve to experience intimacy. At around 2.30 most afternoons, Tekla Schunemann sets off. Where are you heading? Over there, to pick him up. Then I'll come back. And do what? Drink coffee. Tekla is on her way to a nearby building where her partner, Lars, takes part in a seniors group. Both Tekla and Lars are in their mid-50s and no longer work. They live in a group home for people with intellectual disabilities, operated by the non-profit organization Lebenshilfe. In many such facilities, they wouldn't be able to live as a couple, but here that's not a problem, it's just normal. We're engaged. For 20 years already. 20 years. 20 years we've been engaged. So you've known each other since you were kids? No. That's right. Us two, her and me. Think of Adam and Eve. They were also a pair. We're always together. Right. We can't be apart. Have you ever been away? No. No, neither of us. Not even for a few days? No, we're always together. Lassie, here up the stairs. Folks here think Tekla and Lars are a dream couple. Have you ever argued? No, we haven't. Never. We don't fight and never have. Some folks do, but not us. We stick together. That's right. A total of 106 residents with cognitive impairment live in this facility. Up to seven people share an apartment. Some need more support than others. There are care providers on hand around the clock, just in case. The natural way that Tekla and Lars live their relationship wouldn't be a given in other residential facilities. But here, at Lebenshilfe, the residents' love lives are respected. They can decide for themselves what they want and what they don't want. Every person wants relationships. Everyone desires closeness. I think that's part of every human being whether or not they have a disability. Having others decide who their friends are, who they're partnered with, and how they express their sexuality, that would be too great an intrusion into the personal rights of the people who live here. Konstantin Kluss often feels bored. He's 32, and he'd really love to have a partner. I had several girlfriends at school, one after the other, not all at once. Did that work out well? Yeah. It was funny sometimes how the girls fought over me. That's my boyfriend. That's my boyfriend. That's my boyfriend. Konstantin was hit by a car when he was 10. Since then, he has been disabled, he says. He goes to work, his job is in logistics, but otherwise he's at home a lot, alone. Uh, most of them don't want me. Why? Yeah. 
I don't know, but they don't want me. In the past, when I left school, women weren't interested in me. They'd rather be 51 soccer pitches away from me. The further, the better. Just think how big a soccer pitch is. Konstantin is one of Lars's housemates. And of course, Lars has been engaged for many years. At some point, Konstantin decided he'd had enough of being alone and started looking for a girlfriend. I want to have sex with her as well. That's only human. Have you had sex? Yes. I can't remember who with. There were several. They wanted me, and they got me. How was it? Yeah, it was good. Sabine Höfenhaus and Helmut Hermann are a couple, and they enjoy each other's company very much. <laughs> Would you like something to drink? There's some left. Here you go. They like drinking coffee together and chatting. The 60-year-old pensioners have been a couple since meeting a few years ago. At the pensioners group. That's right. I went up and spoke to her. I spoke to her. When he said he wanted us to be together, I said, yes, me too. I asked if you had a boyfriend. No, I didn't have one anymore. The other one died. When I heard about it, I was in shock that he died. The other one. I had to get over that first. Then I got together with Helmut. Sabine lives in a group home, but she spends as much time as she can with Helmut. He has his own apartment and a lot of determination. You have to decide what you want from life. That's how you move forward. I know. Whether you're young or old, you want things out of life. I know. I like to live it up. Me too. I've got the power. You have to take what life gives you. That's what you do. You feel good when we're here together, don't you? When I'm at home, I'm not as happy. Sometimes, Sabine stays over at Helmut's apartment. You share a bed? How is it again? We have two. There are two beds. Double beds. We lock the door so that no one comes in. Yes, some people come into our room. That's annoying. When I want to be alone with Helmut, the others come in. So I say, leave us be. I don't want that. Some things are private. There's a boundary. I don't go around walking into other rooms. Not everyone does. They don't understand. They've got serious disabilities. Almost all the residents here have a legal guardian, so they're not allowed to make decisions regarding their finances, health or place of residence all on their own. Parents, other relatives or court-appointed guardians have the final word. But often, they also want to have a say where relationships are concerned, as educator Geske Steinhäuser knows all too well. It's not as if they forbid it, but they're not exactly thrilled when it happens. 
In rare cases, I've experienced this in all its facets. Then it goes like this. It's nice when they have a girlfriend or boyfriend, and it's fine for them to hold hands or kiss or whatever. But as soon as things go further than that, as soon as they want to spend the night together and maybe become sexually active, then that's the limit. Why is that so? What fears do they have? What negative consequences do they see in two people growing closer here? And how can we allay those fears? And how can we support the people who live here? So that maybe they can even conduct such discussions without needing us as moderators. It shouldn't be the legal guardian's business whose bed they sleep in that night. However, this does not mean that the institution does not get involved at all. Often there is some catching up to do, because in the childhood of many people with intellectual disabilities, sexuality was never addressed or was deliberately hushed up. In my experience, people with impairments sometimes have little sense of shame and can cross boundaries without being aware of it because there's just a lack of education. It happens both ways. People who cross boundaries don't know at that moment that those boundaries exist. People whose boundaries are disrespected often don't know they're allowed to say no when their boundary is violated. It's not as if we leave them on their own and say, OK, we'll leave you to it, have your experiences, and if they're bad ones, that's your problem. We want to assist them so they can find people who they're happy with and get along with. Penis? Good. So today I'd like to talk to you about the genitals of men and women. That's the part down here? Right. You can touch it. Ute Hinzelmann's group on sex and love meets once a month. Here they discuss sexuality openly. No question is taboo. For instance, how do you masturbate properly? Because if residents are to take control of their own sex lives, they need to be able to make informed choices. This group is one of the residential facilities' most popular ones. That's what a penis looks like. When blood flows in, it stands up? Have you seen one before? In real life? We did a strip tease. Strip tease. You know what that is? It was good. <laughs> nice. And you know why? You know, we used to... We did it when we were in bed. Those were the days. Yeah, that's true. Everyone can sleep where they want to, as long as the host is in agreement. It isn't something that we negotiate in an office or a common room, but something they negotiate amongst themselves. But residents also need to learn how to say no, or to seek help before lines are crossed. Love shouldn't hurt anyone here. Why people always associate the heart with love, I don't know. The heart is a muscular pump, a hollow muscle that pumps. It's about getting to know your own boundaries, too. Do I like being touched on the shoulders? Or what is closeness and distance for me? Where does it start and where does it end? We've had to address that because some can't set boundaries. And they don't say no. It's an important topic, expressing your own opinion and asserting your position. Konstantin has heard, and respected, his share of no's. But he hopes that he too will one day find the right person.
When it comes to women, there's not just the one, like they claim in all those sappy movies. There are millions of right ones. So if you don't get one, there's always another. The world's full of women. Constantine says that sometimes he gets really lonely. I'd like to have a girlfriend. Here. Here. Didn't you notice her before? No, she looks pretty. Pretty, my Kati. I'd like to take her in my arms and hug her and kiss her nice and juicy with tongue. Konstantin is browsing an online dating platform, one for people with disabilities. Support worker Marie Graf is helping him out. Start by asking her how she's doing. Yeah. Hey, that's a good idea. Constantine's profile describes his ideal woman quite specifically. No smoking or drinking. Open to kissing and cuddling. Friendly and funny. And someone who likes to laugh, right? There's nothing else to specify. There is. Somewhere you can specify the woman's age. Konstantin sends Kati a message. He's already exchanged messages with several women, but it's never gone beyond virtual contact. Actually met in person? Well, how should I put it? No. Oh, what a shame. Yes, for sure. Maybe it'll work out with Kati. Yes, maybe it'll work out. I hope it does. With Lars and fiancé Tekla, the group home's approach seems to have worked out well, even though not everything runs smoothly in everyday life. It's okay. It's not so bad. I know them. I'm familiar with their relationship. They react to each other's deficits and try to compensate for them. They treat each other like a married couple, like an old married couple. They're very affectionate with each other, and I think behind closed doors they have a lot of sincere things to say to each other. And each of them values having their own room side by side. They regularly go on holiday together, to the North Sea, for instance. We slept together there, the two of us. It was good. But we broke the bed. The bed collapsed. Collapsed. <laughs> oh, Lassie, you're good. The approach has also worked out well for couples Abina and Helmut. They enjoy days out together, like here at Hanover Zoo. If you keep animals, you've really got to know what you're doing. I know. They're the big ones. I know. Everything okay? Nice and quiet, just like at home, peaceful. No people around. Easier to relax. Are you two engaged? No. 
We're just together. Helmut hasn't wanted to yet. He hasn't talked about engagement. It has to come from Helmut. But you'd like to? Yes. If Helmut. But what happens when I'm gone? You'd still have the ring. And what will you do then? I can still take the ring, have it as a keepsake. Could do that. When you're not around anymore, I can put the ring in a drawer, keep it as a memento. That's also an option. People with disabilities can also get married without the consent of their caregivers, although it happens very rarely. Once, for instance, there was an engagement party, but I've never actually experienced a couple making it official and going to the registry office. I've tried speaking about it, telling them if they want to get married, they can. But often they'd say that getting married was so expensive and so on. And then I tried to show them that there are also less costly options for organizing a wedding, but nothing actually came of it. In the water. Now they're both eating in the water. Yeah, they want to. Look, he's going at it. I know. He's not full yet. I know. Not till that's empty. I know. When she was younger, Zabina thought about having children of her own, but she was repeatedly told it wasn't possible. I have a disability. My sister said it wouldn't be good. I can't read or write. I couldn't teach the child anything. I'm a bit sad, yes. I would like to have kids, but I'm also afraid I wouldn't manage. You can't always choose. You have to accept things. It's also okay without a child. No new messages, unfortunately. Look, the last one is from the 10th of November, and there's nothing since. The other messages all arrived before then. Last time, this is what she wrote. Here, you can read it yourself. Hi. Hi, Constantine. How are you? I'm fine. I had a nice day today. I wish you a good night. Do you think it'll work out? Yeah, for sure. I hope so. How does love feel? Nice. Nice. It's nice to be engaged. That's right.